All right, so um, I'm going to introduce uh, the presenter of uh, um, the second session, uh, which uh, focuses on equity, on uh, very important issues um, in architecture. And um, all right, so. Um, in this second session, um, we have um, three, uh, three practices, A plus A plus A, um, and um, the office is represented by Ashley Kuo and Andrea uh, Shini. And then we have um, uh, Jerome Haffer uh, from um, Brent Affer. And then we have Bryony Roberts, which is from Bryony Roberts Studio. Um, so I'm going to, to have a very um, um, brief presentation of them. Um, so um, Ashley and Andrea, as I said, they are part of uh, A plus A plus A, is a, a woman-led um, multidisciplinary design and architecture studio committed to making places more inclusive, collaborative, and joyful. The studio has three partners, Ariana Dean, um, Ashley, and um, Andrea, which uh, previously work on um, residential, retail, office spaces, and speculative projects with firm including RNN Architecture, Family um, New York, Agency Agency, uh, Ana Stanesco, and Food uh, New York. Additionally, um, <coughs> Um, uh, Ashley um, work as an adjunct research scholar for Columbia University GSAP, specializing in research for the Waste Initiative. Andrea Shini, her work uh, focuses mainly on uh, public projects such as a library, um, public housing, and hospital. Um, um, prior to found A plus A plus A, working for firms like Enel Architects and Levin Bats. Um, uh, Jerome Afford is a, a licensed architect, public artist, and educator based in Harlem. Uh, he is the principal in, of award-winning uh, Jerome Afford Studio and co-founder of Brand Afford Architecture. Afford is an um, assistant professor of architecture at City College Spitzer School of Architecture, uh, where he co-directs the New Place Memory and Culture Incubator. Um, after practice critically engages built environment projects in both urban and rural context, um, often looking to marginalize histories to unlock a new imaginary for architecture, design, and uh, cultural infrastructure. Brandon Roberts, um, uh, Brandon Roberts Studio um, is a design and research practice based in New York City. Um, the studio works across a range of scales from uh, community engagement and programming to public art and urban design. Uh, they expand modes of design practice to address uh, the lived experiences of communities and the current inquiries of the public realm. Um, grounded in intersectional feminism, the studio learns from anti-racist and disability justice movement to center embodied um, experiences often marginalized in the built environment, um, celebrating the full range of physical, emotional, and cultural experiences that uh, people bring to public spaces. So I am um, really very, very happy to have all um, these people and professional here. Um, and uh, so we're gonna start with Ashley and Andrea. Feel free to come closer. There's so many people that left. <laughs> um, okay, so we are going to talk about practice. Not too much about our projects. We're not going to go too deep into it, but we're going to present um, kind of like the frameworks that we work through and the thinking that we put or organize our, our work around. Um, we always like to start with a picture of the three of us because our names are Andrea, Ariana, and Ashley, and that's why we're A plus A plus A. 
And I think that's really important to what the practice is. It's really a relationship between the three of us. Um, the three of us come from very different places. Myself, I was born in Peru, raised in Canada and um, Peru, and then uh, moved to the United States, to New York for grad school. Ash was born in Taiwan and was raised both in Taiwan and in the United States. And we met in grad school at GSAP and Ari came from Florida. Uh, so those backgrounds really kind of resurface as like identities that we put on in the practice. Um, very early on, we built the practice off of the GSAP incubator. And one thing that we kept being asked um, when we were building the practice was, you know, what are you? Who, what do you want to be as a practice? Um, and that was really confusing for us because even though we came from architecture school, we didn't quite identify ourselves as people that wanted to do capital A architecture. Um, in fact, we one thing we were sure of is that we wanted to apply our skills the skills that we had learned in architecture school and apply them to some type of practice. And very early on, we were doing diagrams such as this one, which really were words of things that we enjoyed a lot and we had a passion around. And we started kind of trying to figure out how they were connected. And those connections started giving birth to practice and types of projects. Uh, one thing that we have kept going with this is always making sure that this is not a constraint so that um, the grid expands and therefore there's more things that we're interested about that keep connecting back to this. Um, oh, this is a very blurry picture of two chicken <laughs> playing soccer. And no. the point of this picture, which used to be high res, but I actually like how it's not high res now. Um, it's a really wonderful metaphor of what our practice, how we like to think about our practice. It's very fuzzy, it's very non-defined, it's playful, and it's not afraid of getting down and dirty, right? Um, if you really think about the way in which we have built the practice itself, it's framed around three specific um, words which are listening, doing, and playing. And if you put that into um, words that make sense for the public, we are a multidisciplinary studio um, that's committed to making places more inclusive, collaborative, and joyful. So starting with this word, listen, and listening, we do this a lot, and we do it at different scales and different ways. Listening sometimes means spending a full day with a coconut vendor to try to understand what he needs on his every day and ultimately figuring out that he's not just a coconut vendor, but he's also the person that will keep your keys um, just in case you get locked out out of your apartment and he will also um, make sure to watch your kids after school for three hours while you do groceries. So listening means spending time with, with our clients for a full day. Listening also means showing up at community engagements uh, or even community meetings that we're not necessarily invited to or have very little to do with projects. Um, this specific meeting was of the Friends of Tompkinsville Park, which is a, the site of a project that we're working on right now. And they were discussing what to do about the turmoil of the fact that the site um, is, was the place where Eric Garner got killed. In the more advanced and more complicated part of listening, we also like to design experiences and experiences of engagement. This specific example is a scavenger hunt for the site of Tompkinsville Park, which identifies placemakers in the park and rethinks them uh, by asking people 
that engage with the scavenger hunt, what is the relevance of these markers in a site like this uh, in 2023? So the next part of our practice that <laughs> uh, is this idea of doing, so this is Benedict Cumberbatch giving a dramatic reading of a letter from Solowit to Ava Hess. Um, I won't get into it, but you should listen to it. Um, so doing means doing things that people haven't asked, it, asked us to do, but that we feel very strongly about. Um, so this is a project called Assembly for Chinatown, where we started at the beginning of the pandemic to build um, fully subsidized outdoor dining for small businesses in Chinatown. Um, doing also means investing time in the creation of these projects, which can involve organizing events like this, where we're painting and building alongside volunteers and local community members in order to, again, listen to their stories and their narratives. Um, most importantly, to build relationships, empathy, and spaces for collaboration. Um, this act of listening and storytelling becomes important part of our process, creating opportunities for knowledge that is outside of the traditional canon. Um, canons which have largely been dictated by cis, white, western, paternalistic uh, ideologies, giving us the opportunity for empowerment and insight and issues into creative ideas for making positive change. Um, doing also means creating things like this, which are inclusive tools um, with, uh, in order to communicate ideas and provide necessary resources or so using the skill set that we have to help um, small businesses. Uh, a part, another part of what we do is this idea of play, which is our last recurring theme. Um, this is when doing becomes enjoyable and fun. Our projects often involve activities outside of architectural work. That can mean designing youth workshops, experimenting with plants as a medium, tufting, et cetera. Um, this is a project of ours called Healing Spaces, where we designed and built shared healing spaces for a group of youth from Brownsville. Um, over the course of five weeks. So it was a result, this project was a direct result of their visions and their actions in helping shape the future of public space in their neighborhood. Um, and our proposal, the, another part of, sorry, one second. Oh, Let me, I'm just gonna fast forward first. We also tried to bring this level of playfulness to our teaching. This is some of the work of past students who explored and questioned ideas of food justice through the creation of physical object and toys. Um, for us, this idea of play is also the act of taking joy seriously, whether it's working on residential renovations for multi-generational families or proposals for public space activation. So in the end, our practice is as much a creative endeavor as it is an exercise in cultivating meaningful relationships with our projects, our partners, and our clients. Thank you. Hello, everybody. You can still come closer. <laughs> you still have time. All right. Um, thank you, Alessandro, for having me. It's great to be here and to see some friends uh, and some new people. I feel like we actually don't do this that often. Uh, so this, this kind of slightly intergenerational dialogue, I think, is really nice. Um, and it, I feel like it used to be more of a thing and is less of now, but it's really fascinating. So uh, I'm excited to participate, uh, and I will show some of my work. Uh, yes, so um, uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Jerome Hayford. I live here in Harlem. Uh, I used to teach here at Columbia as an adjunct for several years and now teach at City College down the street uh, with Lane and many others. I see a few former students also in the audience. And um, uh, you know, the work I'm going to show is work that has come out of the co-founded practice with K. Brandt Knapp called Brandt Hayford, and then also work that is increasingly um, being done under the, the premise of Jerome Hayford Studio as I have sort of taken over more directorship of the practice. Uh, so is, is this working? Okay. 
Uh, and so I, I kind of show this, uh, this kind of network diagram, which I think is maybe indicative of most of us up here to some degree, uh, which is to say, you know, I, I sort of, uh, you know, it, explore this notion of an expanded practice, which is really kind of um, increasingly a feedback loop between academia, between research, uh, and then built projects and activism. Uh, and I think, you know, to some extent, for example, the kind of academia and teaching, which I think all of us are involved in, also in a way, you know, you could say subsidizes the practice, but I think it also in, in other ways sort of decouples the practice from serving um, capital exclusively, right? Which I think is this question of economies that we're operating in, which is really sort of important and sort of latent to all of this and to also this kind of particular type of practice that I think is gathered here today. Uh, and so, you know, I, um, this was, I think, amazingly touched on by some of the previous comments, uh, but I wanted to give a short plug to one of these, one of the bits of activism, which is like my fourth job uh, uh, that was on the screen, which is this initiative um, that's been going now since 2020 called Dark Matter U that maybe folks in here know about, uh, which is a, a network of academics, recent grads and practitioners um, which is BIPOC-led, uh, that is really sort of attempting to produce a kind of alternate network, um, an alternate institutional model, and sort of explore other modes of practice. And I think also kind of late Im implicit there is this sort of troubling of the figure of the architect, which I think Alessandro and then Ashley and A plus A have brought up, um, which is to say, you know, sort of to reframe the, this figure of the architect as, uh, which is sort of historically kind of raced as white, male, um, quite privileged, bourgeois, serving sort of certain types of capital, et cetera, et cetera. So something like Dark Matter U, which I'm involved with, is really trying to trouble that notion. And I think when we do that, we begin to kind of open up new imaginaries for architecture. And so um, these are just some slides of um, some of the, or I guess, earlier work of the practice and maybe slightly more recent of my um, independent practice and collaborative work practice, which kind of emerged out of uh, these sort of community engaged projects in New York, in various neighborhoods in New York, uh, and then increasingly in Harlem, which I will speak about briefly. Uh, and I would say in terms of the research, where am I going now? Yeah, and that, and you know, the first slide had a lot of these sort of temporary installations, sort of civic projects, uh, and, and there were also some more, I guess, normative capital A projects, again, with Harlem clients over the years. Uh, uh, that includes sort of the, uh, again, more of the sort of typical things that these small independent practices are asked to do in the early years. Uh, and so then, you know, about relocating to Harlem now about a decade ago, that has become kind of a locus of the work. Uh, it's, it's where I both live, work, te and teach. Uh, and so, you know, a space like Marcus Garvey Park in the aerial view there, which is about a block from my home, uh, is, this, uh, is again a kind of site for um, a continued practice, right, for motivating a sort of practice. Uh, and so here's some, some examples of, of public artwork, which is still a, a major component of my practice, my expanded practice, um, that we did in, in the park. This project was about six, five or six years ago. Uh, and these are, this is some more recent work, which I think, you know, again, is in, increasingly um, my, connected to my research, which is really attempting to engage and center historically marginalized um, subjects spaces and modes of cultural practice, which I think then kind of reorient architecture, reorient some of the aesthetics of architecture and reorient some of the ethics of architecture, um, which is then, is, has then come to characterize some of my practice. Uh, and then here's just some other projects in Harlem. This one was also in Harlem. I, have, I did a dining shed as well. We did a dining <laughs> shed. Uh, so this could be like the dining shed symposium. Uh, uh, so this was ours. Um, you know, and then kind of, you know, again, this sort of geography of Harlem, which begins to intersect, you know, a kind of research practice, uh, looking at sites, you know, all within a certain um, kind of close neighborhood and ecosystem of partners and folks and stakeholders, which include myself, and sites like the Harlem African Burial Ground, which is in the center drawing there, 
um, which has been this kind of ongoing research, which also appeared in Bryony's log that she asked me to write about a few years ago, which sort of really unpacked some of these ideas of a kind of alternate canon of architecture, which has then led to sort of, uh, again, exploring other additional sites of, in particular, black indigenous erasure and historical significance, uh, and what that sort of means for our discipline and how to kind of produce cultural infrastructure and a sort of ar architectural vocabulary to speak to those sites. So these are just some images of other constituents, um, also some blurry images. Uh, that have been kind of characterizing this, this sort of national geography of stakeholders um, who I've been working with both in a kind of institutional container and then outside of an institutional container, um, which again are sites uh, in, in particular of sort of um, black diaspora, indigenous um, sign historical significance and erasure. So these are just a few of those sites that have kind of come in and out of the studios, but also now are kind of clients. Uh, and I think also this, this slide is to sort of highlight a kind of economy in my practice that is increasingly sort of grant-funded work, which, which is its own sort of world and landscape of, of, of funding, right? Um, but I think it's, it's interesting in how that has kind of, is now taking up an increasingly larger sector of my practice and represents a different kind of relationship to capital and capitalism. Uh, okay, uh, and so, and then, you know, those sort of sites and clients, um, some of them nonprofit community groups, also kind of intersect then some of these sort of experiments in, let's say, housing that we've been doing over the years in the practice. So um, this, this project for a kind of co-housing in Cleveland, uh, we won a competition for about five years ago. It's still in process, so I think Dash Marshall was talking about how long some of these things can take. Uh, and then, you know, some other, some other images there of that, of that work. Uh, and I want to show a more recent project kind of within this landscape. Um, uh, it, indeed, I wanted to mention of, you know, public memory uh, of an architecture practice, you know, for me is kind of this, this medium to sort of serve um, core work, to serve sort of urgent work. And architecture, obviously, you know, we're talking about architecture facilitating things like housing, public space, but architecture in many cases, you know, or in, in some of the, the ways that I'm trying to sort of explore it is also serving kind of a public memory discourse, which is increasingly sort of urgent and really sort of part, I think we're instrumental in that in certain cases. So this is uh, the, the sort of first place competition entry that um, my practice was one of the winners for, um, for the International Africa Town competition. Africatown is the site of the somewhat recently rediscovered Clotilda slave ship, uh, which you know had this kind of um, rediscovery and New York Times articles uh, around 2019 of this sort of a very kind of tangible history, uh, one of the only sort of tangible histories and sort of tangible archives of the slave trade, uh, which then this community, Africatown, which you see Mobile, Alabama there in the background, is this a sort, one of the sort of only examples of a kind of existing link to Africa of the of sort of descendant community from that remnant slave ship. So this competition uh, was sort of mounted by that community and by Rene Kemp-Rotan and some others to uh, sort, of, um, sort of question what could some cultural infrastructure be, what would a kind of black imaginary be, a kind of Afrofuturist imaginary be, that would in this case also be a very public statement of this history, where this history is being denied, contested, and, and sort of um, is, is always sort of threatened as a kind of public statement. So these are just some images of that, of that winning competition entry. Uh, that I will go quickly, which, uh, which then, you know, I've been trying to test some of this sort of vocabulary, some of these aesthetics and more recent projects. So this is the most recent um, set of installations uh, in Harlem. This is also in Marcus Garvey Park uh, called Sankofa, uh, which is part of a sort of multi-year initiative um, that then had this very interesting sort of community design charrette process, which really challenged me, uh, I think in really great ways, to sort of, uh, and we had a kind of really great discourse around the this, uh, sort of aesthetics of the installation and how that was not resonating with the Harlem community folks who I was talking to. So we sort of worked on how to kind of 
soften, give some texture, give some other sort of Afro-Indigenous qualities to this installation, which I just rode my bike from this morning because we're taking the plants out and we want to save them over the winter. So that's my sustainability plug. Uh, and then, you know, I just sort of end on some, pro some projects that I can't really show, but that, that are continuing this work. Um, this, is a, this is a permanent piece that I am working on for the East River uh, in Harlem. And I think that's the last slide. Thank you. Hi everyone, can you hear me all right? Um, it's great to be part of this event and be in dialogue with all these wonderful practices that I admire. Um, so I'm Bryony Roberts and I'm gonna talk similarly sort of to the previous two presentations, I guess more to process and the approach to thinking about practice um, more than specific projects. Um, and I will talk about that relative to the three practices and collectives that I'm a part of. So my own studio, Briny Roberts Studio, um, WIP Collaborative, which is a feminist collaborative design practice, and an emerging global collective called Feminist Spatial Practices. So um, before I talk about the specifics, I want to frame the ideas behind all this work, um, which is really the theme of Feminist Spatial Practices. So I'll do that through uh, mentioning this diagram that I worked on with Avery Aiken, a recent GSEF grad. Uh, it was commissioned by EFLUX. And the goal of this work was really to sort of expand how we think about what feminism can do for the built environment. So often the discourse tends to focus on just issues of representation, the sort of numbers of people identifying as women or non-binary in practices in academia. Um, but you know, there's so many more ways in which feminist practices can expand how we think and how we make. Um, so it's about different ethical frameworks about how to practice, how to be in the world, and also openness to ways of knowing and working that have often been marginalized in architecture practice. So on the left-hand side here, you see, you know, several themes that are about ways of knowing, expanding sources of knowledge beyond existing canons, by finding ways of learning from lived experiences of people who've been historically marginalized, and often paying greater attention to embodied knowledge and experiences as ways of knowing. And in terms of ways of making, um, many of these practices are really thinking, rethinking the norms of how a practice operates, often through collaborative ways of working that aim to be more sustainable for both communities and environments. So although I sort of you know, work across several of these different themes, you know, as an educator, oops, did this go back? Yeah, as an educator, sometimes writer, researcher, um, and practitioner, I'm, I'll just focus today on the three themes on the right, collaborative practices, spaces for non-conforming bodies, and alternative materialities, which focus a little bit more on practice. So in terms of collaborative practices, um, I think it's exciting to see this sort of generational resurgence, you could say, of collaborative ways of working, many of which you see you know, in the practices presenting, presenting today. And for me, that matters both in terms of how designers interact with communities and then also how to structure your own practice internally, so how to interact with other people that you're working with. Um, so in terms of sort of facing out towards communities, um, in my own practice, I experiment a lot with processes of co-creation and thinking about how to do that um, to sort of collaboratively imagine what's possible for a place in multiple ways. So not, not only through conversations, but also through making things together, walking sites together, really trying to understand um, narratives through um, oral histories, through dialogues. Um, and the work that I do in particular is focused on the public realm, so thinking about how to collectively transform public spaces. And then I'm also part of these other practices which are rethinking how to structure a practice. So WIP Collaborative, which stands for Work in Progress and Women in Practice, is a feminist practice that explores a sort of cooperative model, non-hierarchical, um, you know, equal ownership, decision making, and uh, we do we sort of our shared practice among independent practitioners. So each of us has our own practice, but we come together to do work 
that's at a bigger scale or you know more kind of research oriented than we're able to do on our own. Um, and you can see here a di diagram on the left that's just sort of a conceptual expression of how we think about the seven of us working together and also always being in dialogue with other collaborators. And then recently with Adriana Aiken, after we did that diagram, you know, we always thought that diagram was going to be limited because it was coming from our perspectives, even though it was informed by dialogue with many scholars around the world, many different feminist practitioners. Um, but the goal was ultimately to create a much more global, collective, open source framework to celebrate feminist practices and also to kind of build community and support practices in the work that they're doing. So this is now happening. Um, you can sort of see what we're doing here on our Instagram page and you know, feel free to join us for any of these events which are open. Um, but ultimately we'll be launching this online platform that's kind of an interactive open source um, knowledge sharing platform and a way of connecting and supporting practices. Oops. And then to kind of move to the theme of spaces for non-conforming bodies. So this is, if we think about um, you know, architectural terms, this would be more a program. <laughs> so how to think about um, shining a light on the programs that support bodies that have been marginalized in the built environment. And you know, in the practices I mentioned, this is happening in part through research. So as Jerome pointed to, the importance of grant-funded work. Um, which I think can be really meaningful in enabling you to dig deeper, to work with you know, other scholars and historians or advocates, um, and to think about larger scale change such as policy changes. So the first two projects on the left here are ongoing um, work with WIP, and then the next two are um, through my own practice and research and teaching. Um, but they're all thinking about um, how to sort of support bodies thinking about bodies super intersectionally, not only about gender, but also race and disability, um, to sort of focus on programs that have generally been under um, resourced and um, not explored enough in the fields of architecture, such as spaces for reproductive justice or spaces that support neurodiversity. And then just some examples of how that plays out through design work. Um, so in my own studio, doing projects like Outside the Lines at the High Museum in Atlanta, uh, which emerged from a process of collaboration with um, disability advocates and self-advocates in Atlanta, um, to think about how to create a space in particular that would support um, communities that are visually impaired and also um, people with autism and other developmental disabilities. Um, so thinking a lot about how materials, spatial sequencing, um, sound, um, and social spaces can sort of be more varied and support a range of experiences. And similarly, a project uh, with WIP that we did in, um, in Hudson Square a couple years ago uh, responded to a long-term research and engagement process we were doing, also speaking with young people, with families, um, people with disabilities, uh, particularly people who identify as neurodivergent, to figure out how public space could support a range of activities and engagement and a range of sensory stimulation even within the kind of intensity of uh, New York streetscapes. And then in terms of alternative materialities, um, this is another maybe more indirect way of engaging with these histories of gender in the built environment. Um, I've always been really drawn to and sort of excited by histories of you know, the decorative arts, textiles, ornaments, um, which historically have often been gendered as female and have not been taken as seriously as the sort of tectonic projects of built architecture. Um, but I'm interested in how we can kind of learn from those forms of craft and making and start to kind of explore them at much larger scales, bring them into public space, how that actually shifts the tone of public space, kind of can reference moments of what we might consider typically as domestic, and now that can shift expectations for even the kind of behaviors and social interactions that are possible in public space. So these are just some of those projects uh, where that's been explored, and um, to me it's really satisfying to think about this at multiple scales, so from the really intimate scale of bodies and how design objects can interact and encourage 
interact with bodies and encourage maybe non-normative forms of moving through space um, to larger scale civic projects uh, where in this case at the City Hall in Columbus, Indiana, the textiles created a very different environment for uh, socializing and, um, and lounging than was typically kind of welcomed in that space. Um, or at Lincoln Center, this project for a festival for people with autism that introduced this, this softness and um, leisure, again, to, to sort of return to that theme that is typically not encouraged um, in these monumental public spaces. And then lastly, a project that's in the works opening in a couple months, um, which is also thinking not necessarily in terms of softness, but hopefully its relationship to the landscape is a softer touch um, about how to explore themes of memory and local histories in a way that encourages um, interaction and kind of sensory exploration among the public. And that is it for me. Yeah, it is um, so incredible to see um, how diverse is their approach um, and their work, but also intertwined with the previous um, session somehow. Um, there are elements of, uh, you know, this, this idea of public space, leisure, but also joyfulness and um, in, in, in all the three offices represented here. Um, so again, um, I don't know who wants to go first, but you know, um, I have, uh, of course I have many questions for all of you, um, but um, yeah, as, as, as we did before, I mean, feel free to be an interlocutor among, among each other. Um, um, I don't know if, it, yes, Duncan. You're, you're asking about the friction between nonprofit organizations that want to create those type of spaces and spaces that already exist like that, yeah, more or less? Um, I found often in, in our practice that those, those two quite overlap a lot. Um, we're currently working in a project that I, I showed a drawing of it. It's the triangular squa square, triangle park uh, in Staten Island. And is it, it is an existing space and it's been um, activated by a nonprofit that literally is located adjacent to the triangle. The way that that project is being funded currently is through the local center. Um, it's a very small amount of money that has been allocated to that project for the amount of scope that the nonprofit is actually asking for. So we actually purposely built into our contract that instead of doing what typically you call CA, we are actually creating um, a package of information that can live beyond our um, involvement in the project so that the organization can apply for other grants 
to expand the project beyond what we're doing right now. So does that answer your question, Marla? Yeah, I could just um, maybe answer it in, a, in another direction too, that I think um, a lot of times the projects that I do come from a sense of dissatisfaction from institutions or communities with the existing public spaces and a sense that they're not, they are not activated, they are not working as sort of hubs for local communities. Um, interestingly, they often tend to be modernist spaces <laughs> that I'm asked to kind of rethink, um, the kind of grand, empty, concrete plaza. Um, so I think it's an interesting also preservation question of like how to wrestle with this this legacy of the built environment that's not necessarily serving contemporary uh, urban uh, contexts. And so, yeah, kind of then trying to understand who's not being served, what are all those histories, how do those become expressed, because ends up being what's interesting about the work. Yeah. yeah, I think maybe related to that is there are a lot of spaces where, public spaces where the intention isn't really being or the goal isn't really being achieved at the end of the day. Maybe it's like a negative way where this park that we're working on is actually people com have complaints of danger and feeling unsafe, but then there's also instances of public space that are being used and misused in interesting ways. And so I think there kind of has both in that way where we can learn from those types of public spaces the one that comes to mind is Columbus Park in Chinatown where there's like a ton of older generation people who are kind of using that space almost like an outside living room. And so learning from those types of spaces becomes really important when we kind of use that as a precedent to show you know, public spaces that might not be working well at the moment can have the potential to do something better. And working with communities to understand what exactly they want for those spaces to align with what the sort of public realm or design of it already is existing, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I think I'm getting the, the question. I mean, there's a, there are a lot of obviously spaces in the city that, that don't work very well or are not used, uh, that are underused, a variety of reasons for that. Um, you know, even though I'm not always so optimistic about the role of architecture in that case, I think this, there actually is a, it, there's a lot that comes down to the a kind of designer in the room. And even though this is like a cliche, or should be a cliche at this point, I am still pretty astonished at how often sort of design decisions are being made for, for a variety of spaces in a city like New York without people who are really, who have their ear to the community in that room. You know, it's really amazing to me. So it can make, even if that person is not the architect, though ideally they are the designer, you got to have somebody who is from the community in, in that room, you know, and a sense of imagination. I think I think we're we're sort of in a gen, a new generation where there's not that all of the architects designing for these spaces are not sort of designing these heroic sort of modernist vocabulary. I kind of think the other people involved have way more power than we do in our projects also. Like the nonprofits that we work for, the people who are community leaders have so much say in what happens. And so for us, it's almost like, okay, how do we support you by giving you like our skill set? Sure, and I would say we are also members of these communities. Yeah. You know, this is again like, like the, we're, our, our discipline is so laden with this idea that you, you're, we're not human beings and we're not members of communities ourselves. So yes, and we like recouple our our subjectivity, our political embodied selves to the process, and then it's like we're also members of these communities. Yeah, Imagine or, that. Or you become you become member of the community. Yes. Yes. Through the remember, process. you're mem We are all members of multiple communities. We may not be members of the communities we're designing for. So. Maybe to ask a question to build on that. <laughs> um, I think, you know, one of the things I love about both of your practices, both of which I show like to my students and, you know, I'm a fan of, is that I, I mean, I think 
the kind of baseline is there's a level of engagement and like co-creation with community members. But then I think there's also an interest in addressing content, subject matter that is intangible and kind of difficult. So talking about trauma, healing, you know, stories, identities. And, um, you know, the process of engagement is a big part of that. But I think there's also a push on some of the maybe typical um, materials or methods of, of bringing things into the world, aesthetics, to return to that question, um, that are intentionally, you're intentionally pushing on that in order to address those intangible topics. And, um, you know, and maybe that has to do with an awareness about your own kind of embodied subjectivity as well as a designer. So I'm just curious to hear if you have any thoughts on that or want to share more about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think about this a lot because um, from the moment we started our practice, we kind of put mm, the process of engaging first and then we make something after that. And a couple of years into the practice, we started getting asked, can you come and talk and like present and put your work on slides? And we were like, we don't have anything, you know, <laughs> like we don't really, sometimes we don't make drawings that are architectural, quote unquote, architectural drawings. It's all kind of like in the moment and it's all about showing up and it's all about like interactions between people and conversations that sometimes make the project rather than like putting it in the drawing. So we end up sitting in our, at our desks and, you know, trying to recall or like looking through the camera roll what what did we actually do and how can we make it into a drawing? And it turns out that those drawings actually um, don't necessarily help with the process of the project at the moment. They help to inform what's the next project that can come out of the project that we just did. For example, the uh, scavenger hunt drawing that I showed with the yellow background that I did like three days ago. And it was because I needed to digest why um, that was important for the project right now and how we could push it to the next step of the project. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we could go down a whole tangent <laughs> because, you know, it came up, I think, in the question about this relationship between academia and practice, which I immediately was sort of sitting there wanting us to then discuss what practice is. Uh, because again, there's a presumption that practice is these things, that this thing that the people at SOM are doing in that shiny building for a certain kind of capitaled subject and the, whatever all the rest of us are doing or whatever I do aside from that is something else. So we can maybe can get back to that um, later. But then also what is an architectural drawing? Mm -hmm. You know, I would say that that is an architectural drawing uh, and that, you know, we, again, we have to be, we have to be questioning, you know, what we've inherited as a sort of legitimate practice model and legitimate byproducts of practice um, because it's outdated in many cases or incomplete. Um, and, you know, frankly, a lot of what we're even calling architectural drawings would not have been called architectural drawings <laughs> 30 years ago. So, you know, yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And then to Bryony's question, I'm glad you raised it. Uh, and I feel like a lot of us are kind of in this, walking this, this territory, but I've, you know, I have started some talks by very explicitly refusing this kind of, again, trope of community social engaged practice and sort of aesthetic conceptual practice because I very much am interested in both and the two are very much related. And, you know, there's a kind of value judgment and an aesthetic judgment being placed onto like community work. I've had people tell me I do too much community work <laughs> and it's not sort of, you know, high enough. When I think, you know, whatever it is that I'm doing is extremely sort of conceptual and sophisticated and can also be community work. So I think we also need to be sort of questioning the sort of buckets that work gets placed into. Task that that kind of 
for the architect who formed the one that is performed and constructed with very specific uh, materials that are part of the capitalistic system and uh, of, of the construction industry. And so that's why the framing of the proposal was also packaging with this idea of an alternative financial paradigm that would fuel architecture today. Um, and I think um, what, what you're saying, the question of representation, the question of like what is an architecture of one, uh, it, is, uh, it is crucial in that. Um, and also, you know, just to go back to what you just said, um, it is so, uh, you know, I mean, that, like in the discourse, uh, this question that you do community work, so you have to boot down what that is for the community because the community is not receptive to sophistication. This is a very, uh, like, uh, very racist and also, you know, uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, casted uh, idea of uh, labeling who can perceive certain type of architecture, which is absolutely not true. Um, in the south of Italy um, and with, an, a very, with an aging population, uh, the, uh, the community was incredibly receptive to sophistication and to question of aesthetic. And so it I might not just be archibabble, right, but it's sophisticated. Yeah, you, you do need to build a diagram for them because that's not what architecture's work is. I actually have a, a question to layer on top of that, which I think some people might be interested in. Do you charge for community engagement? Do you like put put it on the contract as in the fee schedule? Do you write community engagement this much money? Um, well, so most of my projects are like fixed fee projects. So I will put it in my budget to explain where the money's going but it's not a separate um, billing process, if that makes any sense. So we I, I do. Um, I end up doing more, but you know, these days, yes, often it is, it is in there. Yeah. And, and then this gets back to, in particular, I think, again, the kind of nonprofit world is more cognizant of the labor of community engagement, which sometimes becomes a really difficult thing where there's an honesty of this project does not have the budget to do community engagement, right? So there have been those conversations, right? Which in some ways is refreshing to have those honest conversations of we do not, you know, we don't know how to pay you to do what to do that labor, right? Yeah, I feel like we find ourselves a lot of time trying to convince clients yeah. that that should just be the norm in like larger public projects. Um, there was an example of, we didn't show this project, but one of our first things that we did together was uh, farm worker housing in a community in Florida where there were developers who were already kind of making proposals for housing without having already engaged um, with the community who's going to live there. And once we kind of brought up this idea of like, okay, yeah, why don't we like ask them what they want? because I don't think that ever came across their minds. And to them, they're like, oh, this is cool, yeah, why don't you do that? And then immediately after our sort of like workshopping stage, they they gave a presentation about like the design of this housing. And we're like, oh, you designed it? Yeah, you already designed it. But it's I, I feel like there's that struggle, and I think we're always trying to convince it that people that it should be a part of the process and we should be getting paid for it. And I think nonprofits do a great job of doing that. Um, but when we're not working with nonprofits and we're trying to do work outside of those organizations, it becomes very difficult. And yeah, I don't know if you have advice on that, but like. Yeah. Something actually you, wait, sorry, before. Uh, something actually that Ashley, uh, Ashley learned from Food New York was in order for the client to respect the work that you do, you have to charge for it. So we've been evolving since that project in Immokalee, we've been evolving the way in which we um, 
charge, but also write our contract so that, say, for example, if the project doesn't have the budget to reach a very specific conclusion, uh, then we just frame the project as something that will reach that in the next round of you know fundraising. But always make sure to put community engagement first. That's the first phase. So even before SD, we, we write community engagement. And it has a very specific fee because it's valuable and because you know it should be respected as, as having a monetary value as well. Um, when Richie from Dash was talking about climate, I was saying um, he he explained they have a strategy, which is to just shift the value proposition from think of all the good you'll do for the world with your little house, which of course people have a hard time accepting or wanting to pay for, um, to think of the benefits for yourself of these kinds of practices for the interior air quality and the and the the the, the, the value that returns directly to you. Do you have similar strategies for? trying to, say, figure out how to value the community engagement or community building efforts that you guys are doing, obviously putting a lot of labor into, um, and which so much define, I think, the quality of the practices you guys are engaged in, to situate that value from yourselves and the community and back into the um, people or institutions that are paying for that work? Yeah, I mean, um, I think one thing that pops into my mind is, in certain cases, that a, a greater assurance of the success of the project and, and the reception of the project. I think, you know, there's a kind of pragmatic political calculus of this is going to be more successful and, 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 and save a lot of headache and heartache later if, if, if we do some kind of you know, and and, and you know, for example, the in in our street shed, the sort of restaurant owners, some of the the people who were part of the bid, were also like the clients, but they were sort of the community. But there still is a something to be said for some at least embedding like one larger gathering or session into that process. That's just gonna, I think, I think that's one value proposition that it'll be more successful. For intending. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think it's a it's a really interesting moment because I found that like a lot of both institutional and then public clients, they know that community engagement is important, but there isn't necessarily familiarity with like the full richness of what that process could look like. So there might be like kind of default methods, you know, like the ones that are required, um, and then the advocacy I feel that I end up doing is like, okay, how can we also think about this in an expanded way? You know, how can we think about more constituents? You know, they may have identified one or two, you know, community partners, but it's like a very narrow bandwidth. And so, you know, broadening who's being 
who's speaking, you know, who's being asked about this project, and then the kind of methods of engagement and like the, the timeline. I mean, I find that the the advocacy is not only for budget, but also for timeline. That um, most clients want it, the design immediately, <laughs> the first step, and so having to kind of push on that and say. Okay, can we just, <laughs> before you see an image, can we just talk to someone first? Um, that, that's a hard thing to argue for. Um, but, it, but definitely arguing that it will be more successful and that there will be more buy-in and more activation. That if you want to activate a space, you have to actually talk to the people about what they want to do there. Um, and I think another dimension of this that's interesting just in terms of like industry is that um, you know, there are now these separate kind of industries of community engagement specialists. And so depending on the scale of the project, it becomes an interesting negotiation of who's doing that engagement. And, you know, how much of that, of those services do you want to take on within your own small practice? And how much do you want to have a specialist do? But then how do you make sure that there's actually like dialogue and good feedback between the specialist and your practice, so it actually is part of the design. Um, and I think also practices like our scale and focus can end up getting asked only to do the engagement. So that comes to me often too. And then it's a struggle to say, well, I have design ideas too. You know, <laughs> I want to be able to like have a bigger scope. Um, so I think it's an interesting moment when all these things are kind of in formation and it feels like both the clients and the fields of design are figuring out like what's our turf and how much is our scope, you know? Can I pick up on this point on community engagement? <coughs> the challenges of Southern Italy, London and New York is about uh, climate and equity equally massive migration coming in. Uh, is there a situation where architects have a role, you have a role in your practices, to actually um, engage with how to plan for this, which is happening, um, how this works with local communities that are related to the people who are incoming, perhaps, but also in terms of the conversion of existing buildings for housing migrants that are coming in and how they fit within the local community. Uh, we've had, uh, I think, in London, about a, a million additional people come in. The social housing has not kept up with that. It will be. It's being planned going forward. To what extent do we, within issues of equity, as architects, need to engage with our local communities to discuss how to deal with this, rather than, if you like, having uh, an us and them situation? And often we come from the same background, except we got here 20 years earlier. Is there a situation where community engagement with this would be helpful in terms of integrating the new communities that inevitably will come as part of climate change? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I feel like we keep going back, I keep going back to the most recent project that we're working on because it's just fresh in my mind. But um, one of the developments that is currently framing the park is a shelter for 300 um, families that are of single mothers and low income. And it's been the, the, pro the project has been delayed for about three years and is finally being completed and the idea the project that we've been hired for is to design a spice market, an Afro-Caribbean Latin food and spice market in, in the park. Um, and through conversations with um, our client, or no, the nonprofit, there's three of them that we're working with, we got to understand that because there's going to be this huge influx of um, people into the space that we have to start rethinking who, um, who the spice market is serving, right? It's not just going to be about selling things, but it has to also be about mutual aid. It has to be about this whole ecosystem of uh, food, who can afford food, what type of foods, uh, who are going to be these people. So yeah, we, I think we do that through, we do that specifically through the community engagement, not just with the community at large, but also, um, trying to 
bring that framework into um, conversations with the clients? Uh, yeah, I think I, I love your question. Uh, and I, you know, I don't know if I necessarily have the expertise to speak to the specifics of the kind of migrant populations, but I think for me, your question touches on some of these things that are very much becoming part of, of my work, and I think the work of others up here in terms of sort of cultural resiliency and even like preservation in an expanded context. Uh, so I'm working on some sort of exp some, some sort of more forward-thinking preservation type projects in Harlem, for example, uh, which again I think comes back to these questions of aesthetics, right, and the aesthetics of say gentrification, and how you know there is this vocabulary uh, of the way that the city is going to look as the neighborhoods grow, as they are rezoned. And then you start to see these high-rise residential buildings popping up on 125th Street, right? So then, then to your, maybe some of your question, how do we as maybe preservation-minded architects of a new generation start to use mechanisms like certain kinds of community engagement, certain kinds of even memory work, work with these communities to, to ensure that Maybe it doesn't look like every other city around the world's gentrified sort of dystopic dream, but that there are kind of other ways of existing in the city, other ways that the city can look being sort of elevated in how we, how we uh, rebuild or how we kind of build up uh, and densify these, these neighborhoods. Thinking about it a lot. Not sure, again, this is like a, this is an emerging territory. I think that we're that we're sort of entering into for the field of architecture. Not for the field of architecture, <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, I have a. Uh, <clears throat> can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, overall, great work. Um, I had a question that relates a little bit more to the post installation of of a community engagement project. Um, I think everyone here can attest or understands values and appreciates all of the work. Uh, the process that it takes to come up with the final uh, project. We understand what it, what it is to talk to the community, be part of a community board, com community engagement project, um, all of these diagrams, the, the ethos, everything that goes into the final installation. Do you guys, as designers, heavily involved in community engagement, do you ever wonder, worry, or are nervous about how the final product, and I say final in quotes because we know that it's sometimes not the final, it's product, it's of a bigger picture, obviously, but for the general public, do you ever worry or wonder that that overall work that you did to come up to this final product gets lost in translation or someone just looks at the installation as like, who came here and just put up posts with little lights? Or who came to the to the center of our plaza and just created for them, it's a play days or a play, a gym, little temporary gymnasium, and they don't really know the overall work that came that came to create this this landscape, right? Uh, so I I just wonder, as, as designers, do you guys ever worry, wonder, you know, does this message actually come across to the general public, not those involved in the community boards, which sometimes it's a handful, just 15, 20 people who are passionate, right? So just was always curious. That's always on my mind for public work uh, that I do and things like that. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts. Yes, <laughs> all, all the time. Yeah, um, I, I, yeah go ahead. I think that for us, it's always how can we make sure that the final result is never a surprise to people. And I think part of that is not just like doing one community engagement event, but making sure that your thoughtfully including people in the process and through all stages, so not just ideation, but for us, I think, like the act of fabricating something together, even if it's, you know, insulated or maybe you're doing it on the street, kind of makes it known to community and people that they're allowed or not allowed, but welcome to partake in it. Um, and I think giving people that responsibility kind of makes it so that you know, this is not a surprise at the end, but makes them feel like they had a stake in it and they had a hand in doing something. 
Um, and so it's, yeah, I think it's just thoughtfully trying to make sure that engagement is included in all aspects of your process from like the beginning to the end and not just having one event um, that fixes everything. Always make sure to throw a party at the end and invite the right people <laughs> that are going to, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. be living there. And these people never are a part of the community board meetings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would also just downplay like the importance of the intention coming through. Like I don't know how important that really is in the end. I think in my mind it's like you're, you know, through this collaborative process, there's the production of some kind of framework for activity and life and interaction. And hopefully when, once that's in place, this whole new ecosystem of relationships and experiences is possible. So, um, and in my experience, that's always like surpassed expectations that people make something their own in ways that you could never expect. And they're so much more interesting than what you might plan for. So I think it's actually more about like learning from the way that people respond to something, sort of valuing like post-occupancy analysis to, to, to call it something super dry. But that's something that WIP did with restorative ground. Like we, we sort of were doing drawings to understand how people would transform the spaces in ways we couldn't um, imagine. So yes, I the intention. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the intention, I don't know. It, it doesn't seem so precious. In a way. Um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, having a certain judgment also of what kinds of thing are going to work out, work out well and have the right kind of people involved. Like I have definitely, you know, had possible projects come into my landscape and I'm like, eh, I'm getting not the best feeling about how this is being set up. So it's really like, you know, we all exercise judgment on where we're going to put our energy. Uh, and then, yeah, sometimes things, you know, you know, and back to maybe your question, especially when you're starting out, like, you know, and, and certain kinds of temporary work, the stakes are relatively low, and you're going to make some mistakes, right? Things, aren't, things don't always work out the way you thought they were, but then maybe something happens that is part of a longer arc of time that I, I think we have to be prepared to engage. So sometimes... Sometimes very meaningful relationships will emerge towards the end of a project. And then that leads to a, a significantly larger project years later. So, you know, I think just being a little bit, it's not to take us off the hook of like the importance of having a certain cohort involved at, at certain times, but you'd be surprised that like when it's a longer arc in our heads of a community relationship, it can be years, many years. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I think part of this is also the people that you invite 
to these whether community board meetings or community workshops, like what are they getting out of it? Sometimes people have things to do and they don't have two hours to spare to like work on a workshop. Mm -hmm. And what we find helpful is making sure wh while we're planning these engagements that there's either a monetary fee that's attached to a stipend given to people or some sort of incentive that they're gaining something out of this as well. So it's not sort of like a one way street. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, every time that we work with youth, we build into the budget that there's going to be a stipend. And that sometimes comes out of the project budget, sometimes it comes from the nonprofit that we're working with budget uh, towards different programming. So it's up to us to build the engagement to overlap with that programming that's already specified. Another thing that you rem reminded me of talk to talk about is um, in architectural lingo, or this is what I learned when I was like working at offices, there's this saying of like, you always have to do so much hand-holding with your client, you know? It, in our experience, in my experience in the work that we do, I actually want the client to hold my hand and bring me in all the time because the client is the one that has kind of like already a position within the community, so I really want them to like invite me to dance, invite, invite me to all the things because Regardless on like how many complicated things we think about about engagement, the most meaningful way of actually making a connection is just like showing your face and being like, hi, I'm Andrea, how's it going? <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry, I have a quick question in the back. Um, just piggybacking off of that community engagement, um, naturally we've kind of been seeing this whole new realm of architectural community engagement in this kind of post-COVID landscape, especially in New York. I know, Jerome, you made a, a joke about it being kind of a dining shed symposium, and I know that initially that community response wasn't too warm towards those um, structures, and then especially now, kind of post-COVID, how zoning guidelines are now making them only part-time temporary structures. So I'd love to hear from you all as people who run practices if that community ga engagement has changed in this post-COVID landscape? Like, have people been more welcoming towards, as you were saying, like pulling you in and, and welcoming you into engaging with that community? Or has that pushback been actually a little bit more fierce? Have they become a bit more protective of this ecology that they've established, especially through the pandemic as well? It really varies. Not all communities are the same, so some communities might be super inviting. For example, when we worked in Chinatown, we already knew some of the community there. We both come from, uh, I'm half Chinese, uh, Ash is Taiwanese, so we kind of already understood the basis of the culture. Uh, so it was easier for us to engage with that community. Um, with other communities, we really show up with a very different disposition. So mostly listening <laughs> and mostly uh, learning. So, I mean, the pandemic did bring a uh, importance or it made it more important to engage with community, but I don't think necessarily that it changed for the community itself that we are engaging with. It changed more for us and for the client. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I found that there's maybe even more awareness of how important public space in particular is for kind of community life. Um, so even slightly more opportunities um, since the pandemic, but I think it has brought up all these new challenges, you know, like during the pandemic. So <laughs> trying to do engagement during the pandemic um, required all of these new uh, formats of, you know, either Zoom meetings or Miro board brainstorming. Um, I did a lot of phone interviews. Um, and, you know, in some ways, I think the multiple formats have actually enabled more engagement afterwards because people who, you know, didn't have childcare to, and couldn't come to a meeting in person can now come to a Zoom meeting. But it is a different feel. I mean, it's different than showing up in person and being able to, you know, share space. So kind of, you know, the pros and cons, I think, are obvious, but um, I, I haven't seen any decrease in interest. <laughs> I have a question for you all, like maybe about your own communities, and 
it, it's just striking how you all belong to this multiple ways of practicing and the shape of each, pra uh, of each practice. I think it's just such a great group to talk about, you know, uh, working with different collaboratives, transitioning from, you know, Weep to uh, Brian Roberts Studio to the Feminist Collective. What, what does it mean to sort of belong to all of these environments or to share authorship between, you know, three partners or to work with Dark Matter and uh, Brent Hayford and Hayford and uh, Kuni. Like, how does one belong and develop a practice when you have many, many practices? Yeah, I mean, I love that Jerome said his four jobs because I also feel like I have four <laughs> jobs. <laughs> it's like it's a few too many jobs, but um, but I think that you know it's obviously like self. <laughs> I asked for it, and I think um, I, it just became really clear to me the need to kind of find your people and like find the communities and or make the communities that are needed to um, to have the kind of conversations you want to have, but also. And it's not making communities because all the people already exist, but it's just like in the act of, of pulling people together, I think there's so much power and like solidarity and just seeing the resonances between different kinds of practices, different perspectives. And um, for me, it's been really transformative to feel like, okay, I'm not like this one person trying to do a thing, but there's actually hundreds of people doing related work around the world and like I learn so much more when I'm talking to them. Um, so for me, it, it's like a kind of survival <laughs> mechanism too and source of inspiration. It's, it's like a really smart biz dev strategy. I think <laughs> that's the business development strategy. I, th I think th that's the way that I see it. Someone once, we've had many mentors in the process of building the practice, starting from New Inc., but I do remember this one advice, which was in order to, big your, to make your practice bigger and sustainable, you need to put yourself out there, and joining things is the best way of doing that. Like you join boards, you join community uh, boards in your, in, in your building, you join like the community <coughs> board and your neighborhood, you join schools, you you know, you just put yourself out there and then people start to recognize you. I think that's because we're in a pro prac class, I think I wanna say that, but at the same time I think um, I think that working with a lot of people brings your ego down, which I think is healthy. It allows you to have conversations that are fruitful beyond like your own self doubt. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have ever thought about starting a practice if Ariana and Ashley hadn't been like, we should just do it. We should just do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think you said it correctly. I mean, uh, unlike Andrea, I feel less social, but I do find it helpful as a way to not just like be so insular in the way that we see things and the way that we do things. Um, so yeah, just like being able to talk to more people is also a form of sort of research in a way and exploration, which I enjoy. Yeah, I, li I like these answers. I do, I do think, you know, to that like network diagram that like w wearing the multiple hats can feed one another in productive ways. Um, but then there's also, I think, <laughs> I mean, at least for me, you know, there, for something like dark matter, there's just a, a bit of a kind of ethical imperative in terms of like, you know, meaning in the work. And, you know, when I was trying to articulate, you know, architecture is this sort of, me this sort of medium that I have chosen to express kind of deep work, right? And, you know, there's just not enough people who look like me or like other people up on this panel who are architects. So something like dark matter is there's, there's just an ethical liberatory imperative to that that also, you know, helps me be excited about getting up in the morning and doing this, right? So, you know, so and and I think um, we're I don't think it's just our field. I think we're witnessing just a generational shift in how people relate to work and again, relate to sort of meaning and what they're doing or kind of the different hats that they wear. 
to sort of motivate a, a kind of constellation of efforts that they're part of. Um, yeah, yeah, but you know, there's also there's also still plenty of folks who want to wear one hat, and that's maybe okay. Yeah, and I also want to, you know, just not to be like the only practical one, but like I want to demystify this idea that the type of practices that we run are like perfect, and we are fed out of it, and that we pay rent out of this. Like we all teach, you know, that helps. Uh, at A plus A plus A, we're not all full time. We do things on the side. We have, you know, side incomes. I think. Um, in order to run these type of practices that like put values forward, we need to be scrappy and we need to have different types of incomes. And sometimes those collaborations allow for that. Um, yeah. I also want to mention that being able to do multiple things, I think, is like a huge privilege as well. I know that, I mean, Andrea has had kind of history with trying to get the right visas to do certain things. And I appreciate the sort of mentorship of people, but also the community around us who have, or organizations that have helped us in our process of developing a, a studio together. Um, like we've had subsidized office spaces, for example, as something. Um, but it is incredibly, I think, privileged. And I feel very lucky to be able to do it, but there's nothing wrong with like having one hat also. I just want to point that out. Um, but yeah, I do, I really appreciate being able to do multiple things at once. I, I wanted to um, draw one thing out from this, in this conversation that's been touched on a few times, um, but it, it's the kind of the role of, you know, there's the architect, there's the community, but there's also the city, you know, this, and the very complicated set of city agencies um, that we're always, you know, dealing with. and. Um, in, in the, there, the city's had many ways of historically trying to engage with architects from the kind of DDC design excellence programs, things like that, which have, I think, I think we've seen another set of relationships with the city starting to emerge and, and a lot of the practices that are, that are here. Um, and I think the pandemic forefronted that in a lot of ways that when say the city's rules started changing and um, we, we were suddenly able to kind of be on the forefront of those rule changes. We, the city went from being a kind of static burden to something which um, we realized was also run by humans. As someone pointed out, we're all humans uh, and, and community members. The, the city is run by humans and community members, it, it turns out. Um, and the, the <laughs> um, but that, um, you know, uh, some of the people in this group are a part of design advocates, which, which I think one of its central insights was this idea that um, by banding together in the group, um, we could have more efficacy in our dealing with the city. We didn't approach the city saying, hi, my name is Nick. I'm a uh, partner of a tiny office you've never heard of called Future Expansion. Um, and we have some great ideas for you. Um, <laughs> but that we could, as a group, we could say, hey, we represent um, not only architects, but small business owners. We're being affected by these things you proclaim to care about. Um, and we are really good at engaging communities. We're really, we could be a useful hinge between the, the kind of desires of the city, at least as stated, and the kind of the work on the ground. Um, and I, I think all that, all those, the kind of effects of that sort of work on the ground or these kind of questions of even um, about the changes to some of these programs um, that from DOT and groups like that, which, uh, you know, Design advocates and other groups, I think, have all been part of those conversations. Have been part of those. We work with this, with DOT and things like this. But I sort of wonder where you see. It, and it's not to say that those things aren't very frustrating. Those, those interactions with the city, you know, um, the the fact that they became possible seemed wonderful. And then the fact that they um, still, um, you know, there, there aren't easy solutions. It's, it's the first gesture, maybe, in something bigger. And so. I kind of, um, and then lastly, I think it's, it, it does seem like it's also maybe the hinge to these kind of questions about an immigrant crisis or all, all these things, these things which are city policy, which are, are bigger than our offices, are bigger than individual communities. Like it's the next step up in the hierarchy in a say from our, our offices to our communities, to our neighborhoods, to our city. Um, 
And so I, I'm just curious from you guys, like how you, where you see the productivity or where you see your strategies in dealing with the city specifically um, will lie. Yeah, I mean, I could offer two, two thoughts on that. I think one, um, you know, I think size does help. <laughs> and so, you know, one of the projects that we're doing with WIP is with Design Trust for Public Space and Verona Carpenter Architects, and that is trying is aiming for ultimately, you know, policy change around how public spaces are designed so that they can be more neuroinclusive. And that's a kind of long-term project of building partnerships and having, you know, it's like a three-year project. Um, and the funding is coming from grants and foundations and things. Um, and so, and Design Trust is sort of the, you know, the mediator, the connector that makes that possible. Um, so I do think you're right that like these larger advocacy sort of conglomerates <laughs> are really helpful in, in having a voice um, in change. But I do find that actually a lot of the agencies are very receptive Again, like they know that there's something missing. They know that they should be better. And they want to learn from research that architects can do. But it's like producing those channels and those formats. Um, but I guess in contrast, I actually end up doing a lot of work outside the city in my own practice. Most of my projects are not in New York. They're in smaller cities or even towns, you could say, often in the Midwest. And I find that that's a really different situation that is often really refreshing. <laughs> that like when you're dealing with a small context, you know, you only need to know a couple people and like pretty dramatic change can happen through these very personal relationships um, because everybody knows each other, you know, and you have a couple people who are advocating for a different way of thinking about public space or, you know, more investment in the arts or something. and they all went to high school together. And so, you know, there's like, it's just a really, really different terrain. Um, and, and I actually find it often kind of exciting because they're also wrestling with huge questions of social change. A lot of these cities are, you know, the demographics are rapidly changing, partly through immigration, partly through a lot of people moving out, you know, and like recruitment of new communities coming in. Um, so, there are like similar themes, but a very different scale of agency and yeah, activity. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I, I've had to learn a, a thing recently, which is um, kind of difficult for me to swallow, but architects are always very, very late to the party. Um, in the work that we've done with nonprofits or even like clients that are for profit that have been like, have a specialty, they, like I found that we come in and I always think, okay, the project starts now. That the project has, the project and the thinking has been going on for a really, really long time and we haven't been invited to the party until like, okay, can we do a design now? Or like, we might do something now. Um, so I find that actually the nonprofits that we've worked with have already done the heavy lifting of building relationships with city boards and even you know know them so well that they have them in their phone and they text with them all the time. So that has become quite helpful. Um, again, in Staten Island, like Staten Island is part of New York, but it really works as a micro town and everyone knows each other and so the nonprofit that we are working with walk into these like parks office and you know all the time so <laughs> yeah <laughs> so other questions okay. yes uh, thank you for the really fascinating conversation so there is something I'm not sure understood, and in case I have a question, understood that you said uh, in some cases the giving, giving back for the community was also monetary, right? Oh, excuse me? You said that the giving back to the community to engage them in the participatory process, that giving back was monetary, money, cash. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so. I'm an architect as well. I've done several uh, participatory processes in totally different contexts. Rome, Italy. Turin, Italy. 
Calaf, a small village in Spain. And uh, from my point of view, the reason of a participatory process is uh, to build community and to make the project belonging to the community. So my question is, if you arrive to the point you have to pay the community to, the, to participate, does it mean that maybe the way you started the process, the first phase, the one to invite people, that one is not working and maybe you should look another way? Because if you give money, you don't make community. Money is for the single person. Maybe if you make a collective uh, lunch, I'm saying a random thing, that makes community. Yeah. If you make an exhibition with works from the... There are several examples. So I want to understand, I don't never done anything like that in New York. I think... But I think you, how do you get you to that? You raise a really good question. And I think the most direct way to answer is you're assuming that community doesn't exist already and that you're creating it with your project. Well, the truth in the context that at least we have worked in is that community already exists and we are doing engagement to become part of the community and to get feedback on something that we might create for this community. Um, the reason why we build in stipends for community engagement, especially for youth, is because our type of engagements take a long time. And because time is money, and because um, if they're not here, if they're not spending their time here, they would be spending their time in their part-time job, you know. So, yes, I think that you know, sometimes you get the opportunity that engagement creates a more solidified community sense, but at least uh, for our work, we always assume a community already exists um, and we are just being invited late to the party. <laughs> I also think that part of it is getting people who maybe isn't interested in community engagement, but are imperative to the project in a way. So the youth, I think, is a perfect example. Maybe they don't care. They don't want to spend their like Saturdays doing something like that. They want to hang out with their friends. But if they're getting paid for it, then maybe that's enough incentive to bring them here to actually be a part of the process and hopefully get them interested and engaged. Um, but yeah, just kind of understanding like who it is you're trying to bring in and making sure that what they're getting in return is worth their time. Yeah, I think the last part you said is super key. Like that that sense that there's something, there's a benefit for the people involved. And so for, you know, I think there's a couple different contexts. So like a community board, people have already decided they're gonna volunteer their time to be part of that and to give feedback to processes. So like, you don't have to pay them. Like that's an existing, you know, institution. But I think, um, I, I think there's just more, you know, discourse around these issues of labor now and this um, understanding that you know people are going to come and spend their time and basically contribute to your project. Yes, yes. Well, yes. Right. Yeah. The thing is that the, the will, of course, you have the project will, will prolong itself. I agree, but I think there's also more and more awareness, particularly around nonprofits, that like there is this expenditure of time and effort that it takes for people to participate. So even just transportation, right? Like someone, if they're coming from a different borough to be part of your workshop, they're spending money on transportation, they're not working at their part-time job, There's a, there is some loss for them, some sacrifice in being part of it. And so it's like an acknowledgement, usually a, a modest one. You know, I mean, people don't usually do it for the money, right? <laughs> but. Of the intern that you know, that they, 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 that you have that, which is like a 
love constant inquisitive We don't really go to interview our community around the corner uh, without having a concrete reflection of the time. Uh, a little bit of concrete reflection of the time is nothing to do with the past. <coughs> um, if I might squeeze a question in. Thank you so much for your presentations. It's amazing. And I, I think what the PowerPoints like don't say is how much work goes into it. It's, it's so full of joy, and I think joy has been this recurring theme. Um, and and I, I'm also seeing so much labor, so much time beyond the kind of traditional timelines. Um, uh, and it's hard to squeeze it all in 15 slides. But I'm curious about about joy in your practice, and joy as and I feel like maybe this is kind of a feels like a key term to me in terms of rethinking practice. It's not the same as happiness. Joy is not not reward per se, or or um, a certain kind of like how traditional practice might understand success to be. So I'm just curious about how joy or even like liberatory um, uh, coalitions might like. What is the concrete? Uh, I guess your your approach to joy and in, in maintaining joy in practice. Yeah, I mean, spoiler alert: we're not making a ton of money doing this. <laughs> if you want to make a lot of money, go be an iBanker or maybe cross enroll in the real estate program here or elsewhere. Uh, but you know, like, I maybe lots to say, you know, I think this gets back a little bit to even the kind of post, post COVID world we're in where, um, you know, even before that, I think, you know, the decision to really dedicate oneself to something like architecture, I think there's there's a lot of meaningful hand-wringing around the financial proposition of that. But, you know, I think speaking from a place of relative privilege, there is a point at which I would say for me and probably most of the people in this room or part of this panel, the pursuit is, is not to make as much money as possible. Uh, and, the, and I think increasing numbers of people who are privileged enough to even think beyond immediate survival are really questioning that as a kind of ethic and a sort of American, you know, late capitalist pursuit. Anyway, we go, go down a rabbit hole. But, um, you know, there's also this element, again, of kind of community building uh, and activism, which can also get very sort of... Um, intense and and kind of emotionally draining uh given all of the crises that we're responding to and that we're trying to solve because we're architects uh when you know i often try to remind myself and other sort of collaborators co-conspirators um that i'm involved with that you know we there is a lot to be said for you know centering joy and kind of a speculative project within activism or within sort of mission-driven work. Um, because if we get caught up in simply sort of reacting to white supremacy, to late capitalism, and you know, you, stuck in a reactive paradigm always, then we are not permitting ourselves to sort of imagine and dream, which I feel like is really important for us to do and also really important to enable you know, these sort of community members we're talking about to do. I go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a really I one totally topic. agree. I think also part of for me is for selfish reasons. I there's a lot of anxiety around our work and just as a student and as someone practicing that if you're not doing it for joy, it gets a little heavy in a way. So I mean super selfish reason. But I do agree with everything you were saying as well. We do have as a as a practice a goal, which is to be 
for sustainable, like um, economically sustainable within the three of us. That has been our goal, I think, from the beginning to be able to pay the three of us fairly and fully for our time. And then when we're ready to be that way, which, you know, fully 100% to then start to grow in a way that also can sustain um, others with this with the same standard. And I think that pursuit in itself brings me a lot of joy on top of just being very in love with my partners. Um, I, I just I really like them. So working with them, it's really joyful. <laughs> um, I love that question. Thank you for that. I think we don't talk about it enough, you know, that in in theory, this is a creative profession. <laughs> and in my mind, creativity is is a kind of joy. And it takes, to actually be creative, takes the sort of some unstructured time and exploration and play just to see what could happen with a material, with a shape, with an idea. And, um, and I think that it takes a lot of fierce protection to like carve that time out of, a practice, a, you know, an academic career, whatever. Um, and in my, for me, it's always a constant struggle of like trying to just carve out that time or build it into the process for each project. But I think it's really important to do. And for me, that's a big motivation behind rethinking practice, like rethinking the format of practice um, so that I have that freedom to like make some of that space and then be able to hopefully make work that offers that, you know, for other people too. Um, and I think just to, so that we don't inspire despair in the students, <laughs> it is definitely possible to make a living in architecture. <laughs> Some people even make a lot of money in architecture. <laughs> um, the, yeah, the road of, the particular road that um, at least Jerome and I travel <laughs> of, you know, is not, is not incredibly lucrative, but I think it is possible to find these alternative ways that can be sustainable, financially sustainable, as long as you don't dream of, you know, having a beach house or something. I don't know. <laughs> and I, I, oh, are you, are you, I want to make a, a plug. There is a slide of it, but the in the October or most recent issue, I think one of the last print issues of Architect Magazine, which is the AIA's publication. It's the most widely circulated sort of architecture periodical for the profession, uh, was a, a takeover by this organization, Dark Matter U, that I'm part of. And it's called the Justice and Joy Issue, uh, which again is part of sort of resisting these kind of tropes, these binaries that like social justice work has to be always very sincere and react, reaction based. Um, that there is a very, very important space that must be created for especially marginalized designers, marginalized people, to think imaginatively, to be creative, and to contribute in that way um, as well. All right. I think we um, came um, at the end of the session number two. Um, these are really uh, necessary and timely conversation. Um, really rethinking how we can practice, how can we sustainable, but sustainable also within the ecology of uh, the idea of practicing because it needs to uh, support us. And uh, um, it is very interesting to see uh, all your work and, and what you're doing. Um, so um, I really thank you so much for that.